This is the caveman era of big data. We're just starting to understand how important it is and how it's going to start influencing every aspect of life on Earth. The first time I heard the word big data, I was at the TED conference and I ran to Marissa Mayer, who's an old friend who was at Google at the time. She's now at Yahoo. And uh, she was asking me what I was working on next. And uh, she suggested this idea of big data. I said, what's, what's big data? And she said, some people describe big data as the planet developing a nervous system. And I said, wait, say that again. That's really interesting. She said, the ability now to measure, analyze, visualize, and then respond to what's happening all over the world in real time is something as a species we've never had before. That our smartphones have turned us all into human sensors, our browser histories, our credit card transactions. There's this triangulation of data in real time, cause and effect are now being connected for the first time. So I thought that's, that's really fascinating. She showed me this um, incredible quote that Eric Schmidt, uh, the chairman of, of Google, had said, where all the information created by the human race from the dawn of humanity until 2003 is five exabytes. And now every two days we're creating five exabytes. Basically every object on Earth, including our bodies, are starting to generate data. And that's why we did the human face of big data. Right now, 2013, we're exactly in the world of big data where the internet was in 1993, when people are just hearing about it. We're just starting to understand how important it is and how it's going to start influencing every aspect of life on Earth. Here's a great example. For years, pharmaceutical companies have been designing disease, uh, cures for diseases. And they find out that while 99.9% .9 of the people who take this particular drug might be helped by it, 0.0001% might be adversely affected or, or killed by it. So they can never release that drug. Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institute for Health, gave this wonderful talk at TED Med last year. And he said that when Steve Jobs was diagnosed uh, with his disease a few years ago, it cost $100,000 to sequence his DNA. Today, it costs $4,000. He believes within five years, it'll be $40. It'll be like going to Walgreens and getting a flu shot. And that before any doctor can prescribe any drug, they will first look at your DNA and find out whether that drug will help you or hurt you. The point he was making though is that these big pharmaceutical companies have developed all these cures for diseases that are sitting on shelves because they couldn't figure out five years ago who would be helped and who would be harmed. The fact that these cures exist, that they're sitting there and can be dusted off simply by you having an affordable uh, DNA sequencing test is really, it, it's so exciting to find out that we're on the, on the cusp of this in so many different industries. There's a couple of stories in the book that, that I think are kind of really delightful. And there's one of a bunch of bats flying. And uh, the story is that around uh, airports, uh, for years, the radar operators have complained about the noise by birds and bees and bats and insects on their radar. They're trying to filter that out so they can look at weather patterns or look at uh, airplane movement. And a group of scientists about six months ago said, wait, wait, you've got 15 years of bat migration and you've been throwing it away? <laughs> Are you crazy? So I love this idea that what for one person is garbage and for somebody else is, is utter gold. The Gates Foundation has been trying to eradicate uh, polio in Nigeria. Looking at satellite maps, they found there were villages in Nigeria that nobody knew existed. They, were, they didn't exist on any known map. The government didn't know these people were there. And so the Gates Foundation has just given out 10,000 GPS-enabled cell phones to polio inoculation workers to make sure they go to every single hut, every single family, every single child. Unless you inoculate everybody, you can't er eradicate it. So this idea of using satellites combined with cell phones to eradicate polio it's not something that was sort of, you know, leaped to mind when you think about the phrase big data. So I think we're going to look back on 2013 as a year that everything changed. We have so many problems that we're facing as a species, so much of which are caused by either misinformation or information that's you get it too late. You know, something happens and six months later is the result and was it, was it that or was it all the 400 things that happened in between when you can actually connect the dots? It makes a tremendous amount of difference. You know, I love this idea of adding new technology to each of the projects that we do. So we were trying to think in terms of telling the story of the human face of big data. Um, my kids went to see all the Harry Potter movies and one of the things we all thought was the coolest was when there was like a newspaper and you could touch on the person in the paper and they would turn around and talk to you. So we found this really cool technology where it's called Erasma and uh, basically uh, there are 21 
places in the Human Face of Big Data book, and you just download this free app, it's called the Human Face of Big Data Viewer, and you simply point your smartphone at that page and it recognizes the photograph, and then it plays a TED Talk or it plays a YouTube video, it just reaches out to the internet. So it sort of connects this 500-year-old medium of the book to the internet. There's just a great element of fun to it and expanding the, the reach of the book. People have laughed of saying, why would you use an old medium like a book to tell the story of big data? It doesn't get lost on a hard drive. It doesn't get out of date. Uh, it doesn't require updates. It changes every time you pick it up because you're a different person every time you pick it up. And everybody in your house it comes at it with a different perspective. Books that I did 15 years ago, you can still find on people's shelves. Try to find a website or a CD-ROM or a DVD or an app from 15 years ago. They, it just gets lost on your, in your hard drive. So you know, if, our, if people like our book enough to put it out, it stays there for an awfully long time. Hi, I'm Rick Smolin. Please subscribe to Thinker.